about what's going on inside the state of Alaska. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Michael. How are you today? You know, not too bad. Um, I mean, I guess all things considered, at least I'm not a glowing spot in the pavement or something with all this North Korean <laughs> talk. Let's let's talk let's talk a little bit about uh, some other you know, kind of nuclear options that we have on the table, uh, oil, gas, politics, but more importantly right now, the governor is now talking about this special session in October because no matter what's going on, apparently everyone in the legislature, with the exception of a very few, have decided that the best choice for Alaskans is new revenue, which of course translates, no matter which way you slice it, into taxes in one form or another. Um, you basically say it's still the economy that's at that's at stake here uh let's let's delve into that well i've I've been having this debate with friends over the last few days and indeed this morning about uh about this whole new revenue issue and and they like you like me like others uh push back and say you know look we don't need new revenues we don't need to um uh, uh start taxing the alaska economy uh, we can live within our means. Uh, we can we can implement Hammond 5050, and we'll be fine. I agree with all that, but the fact is, the last two years now, the government, first the governor, and this year the legislature have cut the PFD uh, right. in half. They've cut it substantially, and so they are raising new revenues, whether, whether we like it or not, whether we want to push back or not. Uh, the legislature, the government is raising uh, so-called new revenues by taking money out of the private sector. And, and the governor wants to formalize that. That's what this coming special session is going to be is going to be targeted on, formalizing, raising new revenues. So as much as we want to push back and say we don't need to have this discussion, uh, we can live within our means going forward, the government's moving forward with it. And, and I think – um, it's time we, you know, discuss that. It's time we discuss the elephant in the room. And and to me, the the most important consideration of dealing with this issue of new revenues is what's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families. It's, I mean, everybody sort of wants to say, well, I don't want to pay that. Let's have somebody else pay that. The top 20 percent, for example, uh, by income in the state say, let's cut the PFD, because guess what? That transfers the bulk of the problem to other people. The, uh, the, the lower income segments say, let's have an income tax, a progressive income tax, because guess what? That transfers uh, the bulk of the problem to uh, the upper income level. Everybody's right. got, got their own pet solution uh, to try to transfer the problem to somebody else. To me, if we're going to do this, we need to be talking about setting all that aside, setting everything aside about about trying to, you know, who 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 can I push this off on? Uh, we ought to be we ought to be focused on what's if we're going to go down this road, what's in the best best interest of the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families? And and again, I think I I mean I hate to have to put a disclaimer on every time we talk about this, but I want to make it very clear uh, that both Brad and I are against any form of new revenue or new tax uh, that's out there. But if this is a discussion that must be had, and apparently, based on what's going on with the with the legislature and everything, it is something that must be had because they've decided that it must be, that at least we need to discuss what is the most palpable or least destructive of the different revenue options that are out there on the table. Yep, absolutely. And and I think you know once you sort of once you sort of set all that aside and and again they've done it the last two years they've cut the PFD the last two years they've created this so-called new revenue the last two years so it's it's not like you and I are creating something new it's something the governor and the legislature have done the last two years so once once you so once you get past that point you talk about what's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy and and Alaska families. Some things become very clear very quickly. The first is cutting the PFD is the worst way to do it. According to ICER, according to all of the economic analyses that have been done over the last two years, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy of all of the revenue options. That's, that's not an argument. That's a fact. ICER right. analyzed it. You can, go, you can go look it up. 
the 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 other conclusion is cutting the PFD is the worst option from the standpoint of Alaska families. It has the largest adverse impact on the bulk of Alaska families. Again, that's not an argument. That's a fact. You can go to ICER and look it up. So if if you are if you're focusing on putting everything else aside, if you're focusing on what's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families, cutting the PFD is the last thing you want to do because it has the largest adverse impact on both of those, on both the economy and families. And in the mid, and, and especially in the middle of a recession, that's the last step you want to be taking. You don't want to be you know, sending your economy deeper into the hole by taking income uh, and jobs out of it. You don't want to be spend, uh, uh, pushing Alaska families deeper into their hole, closer to the edge, uh, by taking money out of their uh, 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 personal economy. Uh, but that's, that's exactly what the PFD does, So th- cutting the PFD does. So we need to have this debate. We need to talk about what's in the best interests of the overall Alaska economy um, and, and Alaska families. Frankly, I think it's a flat tax. I think treating all Alaskans the same, taking the same percentage uh, from all of them, and you can do that all the way through the categories. It's not like a progressive income tax, which only hits the highest income payers. You can do it through all of the income brackets uh, and take you know, uh, the proportionate share uh, uh, from the from the low income brackets as well by withholding it from the PFD, um, I think that's the fairest way to do it, and it has a relatively neutral effect uh, on uh, on the overall Alaska economy. But it's issues like that that we need to be talking about as we move into as we as we approach this special session. Again, they've cut. I mean, the government has done it the last two years. We're sort of they've past already, the yeah. point of what they've of already we're taxed do it. us. Yeah, I mean, yep, that's the exactly. thing. They've already taxed us. They've already put it into place. So it's already affecting us. And see, that's where people get, well, we don't need a tax. Well, they've already taxed us. This is not like this is not like the first shots in this war, this salvo have not already been lobbed. They've already done it by cutting this. And of course, now with the Supreme Court decision saying that this is just an appropriation and this is just the way it is. Uh, you know, it opens it up for even, you know, more of this uh, moving forward down the road. We've got to frame this argument. And I'll be honest with you, Brad, everybody that I've talked to, uh, you know, this is this course is anecdotal, but my sphere of influence is pretty wide. Everybody that I've talked to has been reticent, if not downright hostile to any kind of uh, of new taxes. Uh, and when I point out that the PFD is already a tax, that just makes them even more incensed. I, I just think that the only people that are for this that I've seen thus far are politicians and the people in the special interests who are supporting these things. I don't see the average Alaskan being all excited about this right now. Yeah, I, 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 I agree, Michael, but, but they've done it. I mean, it's, you know, it, we may have, there will be a come a point of reckoning in next year's election about whether they should have done it and whether we should, we should maintain and retain those politicians, those legislators and, and the governor that did this. That, that, that cut the PFD, that went to the new re- revenue option, uh, that's, that's an issue we will have in next year's elections, both in the primaries uh, and in the general election, and we'll be talking about it then. But they've done it, and, and, and we need to confront that reality and, and talk about if we're going, if we're going to do this, uh, what's, what's the best way to do it? I mean, there are those out there who I will talk to and say, well, they haven't taxed us yet. We need to keep pushing back. You, you, you do. They, people have to realize that the PFD cut is a tax, that, that right. it has impacted, it has taken revenue, it has transferred revenue out of the private sector, taken revenue out of the private sector of the Alaska economy, and put it into the government sector. It has taken right. money out of the hands of, of Alaska citizens and put it in the hands of government. It has taken the decision process the economic decision process out of individual Alaskans' hands and put it in a very narrow, the very narrow hands of the lobbyist-influenced government. It, 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 is, it, is, it is a wealth transfer from the private sector to the yeah. government sector. By any definition, that is a tax, and, right. and, 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 and we have already had that. So we just need to talk about what the best way to do it is. We're going to do this. 
And, of course, they're going to be called in a special session. The one thing that I have not seen on the table is any kind of flat tax. Of course, the House wants the progressive income tax. The uh, the Senate wants, again, to tap deeper into the permanent fund and and look at other forms of taxation. But nobody seems to be talking about the idea of a flat tax. I mean, one side uh, talks about the uh, effect on the upper income stream, as you point out, and yet those same people that talk about the downside of a progressive income tax against the upper income stream seem to be oblivious to the impacts of a PFD take from the middle to lower income classes. And so, I mean, there's just a lot of hypocrisy floating around uh, in and amongst the halls of power right now. To some degree, Michael, I think the reason the flat tax hasn't hasn't uh, uh, gotten the traction it needs is because those of us uh, who who focus on these issues have have spent so much tr time trying to say that you don't need to do any of this, and we've focused on right. trying to draw the line at any new revenues as opposed to talking about which which are the best new revenues. Right. Um, and I think as a result of that, we've left the field to those people who do class warfare. We've left the people to those to the top 20 percent to say we're going to do it through the PFD because guess what? Somebody else gets to pay for it. And we've and, and on the House side, we've left it to those people who say, oh, no, the high incomes uh, uh, ought, to, ought to pay for it. I, that's part of the reason why I think we need to move into talking about this issue, uh, because they're about to go down the road uh, of of. Two very bad things, either uh, maintaining the cut in the PFD uh, or an income tax, or in the case of the House, both, um, uh, they're about to go down that very bad road because, frankly, you know, some of the rest of us have sort of just had our heads stuck in the sand saying, no, 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 you can't do any of that. I, the reason I'm talking about it now and the reason I think we should be having a public discussion about it is because I think the flat tax needs to be on the table. It's the one thing that is that is neutral in its effect among Alaska citizens. It's the one thing that's neutral really in its effect on the overall economy. Um, uh, it doesn't take money out of the out of the hands of, of some segment disproportionately. Um, and, and I think it's the I think it's the thing that needs to be on the table. So um, <laughs> it's not been on the table, frankly, because I think that those of us who who think along these lines have just you know sort of resisted talking about it along the way, right? Well, we, we and again, just to be clear for listeners out there, we're we're still saying that, but we're not getting stuck. We're still saying that, meaning we don't think that new revenues are necessary, but we're also now trying to stake out the territory to say if new revenues are inevitable, that at least choose the one that has the least impact, which of course at this point would be the flat tax. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the governor's dreams. The governor has this dream of a gas pipeline, of a gas pipeline corporation that finds interest and investment from uh, different players outside the state of Alaska. Uh, and they're in the middle of an open season. What does this say to us here? we got about 90 seconds here, Brad, to, to kickstart this part of the conversation, and we can pick it up on the other side. Well, I think, I think the point of this, and Craig Medrid has an excellent piece in his blog, I think the point of this is is the open season ended uh, at the end of August. People either made uh, sh potential shippers, either made commitments or didn't uh, at the end of August. And so we've sort of hit another gate uh, in the history of Alaska LNG, uh, and we need to talk about what the implications are of that. It's not that we're in the middle of one now. We've ended one, and now we need to discuss as Alaskans what the – what what happened in, during that open season and and where we go uh, where we go from here it uh, it it really is um, th this really is an interesting discussion because uh, we've got a lot of people on both sides of the aisle here taking a look at this project and saying it either it's it's not economical or it's it's uh, it's pie in the sky uh, the governor has yet to come out with a you know with kind of the 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 brag list I should say. Uh, but we're going to get into this just a little bit deeper on the other side. We're going to continue the discussions with Brad Keithley. We're going to talk a little bit about the gas line uh, and what the open season means and what it brought. We're also going to talk about the permanent fund hitting this milestone of $60 billion. And what does that portend for us here in the state of Alaska? It's all coming up right here. We jump in and continue our discussions now with Brad Keithley, who is... Uh, 
uh, a former oil and gas consultant and counsel. We've been talking about uh, taxes and budgets in the state of Alaska. Right before we went to the break, we started talking about the governor's gas line proposal. The open season just ended. Uh, we don't really have any details as of yet, but of course, the big uh, part of this whole deal is that this is a lot of money uh, that's being flung around out there right now, and we're not exactly sure where it's going to go and what it's going to cost us. Uh, Brad is going to give us a few more details on this before we move on to the permanent fund itself. Brad, uh, your thoughts on what you're hearing anyway about the open season and what it uh, portends? Well, so this this is another important gate uh, in Alaska LNG. The governor has said he's not going to move forward on this project if he can't demonstrate if we if we if we can't demonstrate that we have markets uh, for for the gas and for the for the transportation capacity and the line that that the that would be built uh, that that he's that this funding has been to try to move us forward uh, to get us to the point where we can go out to the markets. Um, and, and that's what the open season was supposed to do. It was supposed to go out to the markets and say, hey, uh, now, is there an interest uh, in the sufficient interest in this line to to uh, uh, to go forward? And then from the open season and from the market's response, you then start thinking about financing. Uh, if you've got underwriting, if you've got contracts, if you've got commitments for use of the capacity, then you can go start talking to the financial markets and say, uh, look, here's here's the security, uh, here's our collateral, in essence, for uh, uh, for uh, the money we need, the loans we need, the investment we need to make, be able to make this project work. Uh, are these is are is this are these contracts sufficient to go forward? So this this is an important gate. The governor's built it up. Uh, a year ago, he said um, he made a comment that uh, we'd see where we were in a year, and uh, if we hadn't. We weren't progressing this thing. That that even he was prepared to close it down, um, and and this open season has it coincides with sort of the end of that year period. So, this is an important gate. I and others are going to be paying a lot of attention to what comes out of AGDC over the next uh, over the next several weeks uh, as they talk about the open season and as they as they give an indication of what happened. The only thing we've seen thus far are two things. Uh, one of which is halfway encouraging, not not really hugely encouraging, but sort of halfway encouraging, and the other of which is frankly discouraging. The first that we've seen uh, is the discussion of, of the fact that, that uh, the AGDC had entered into, quote, confidentiality agreements covering several markets. Uh, that was a statement that, uh, uh, that Keith Meyer, the, the, the president of AGDC, made uh, recently. Uh, that sort of sort of makes you think that maybe uh, uh, the open season has triggered uh, more detailed discussions about entering into contracts. Uh, you can understand why there's confidentiality agreements around contract negotiations. You don't have a contract until the negotiations are finished. Uh, and so that's halfway uh, a, a, a positive development. Uh, but frankly, you know, you're supposed to have more at the end of an open season. You're supposed to have people who have made commitments. So sort of, sort of a plus, maybe not a whole lot. The other thing that frankly was a negative is, is Keith Meyer gave a speech last week or the week before to Commonwealth North uh, that talked about uh, the obligation of producers, that producers have an obligation, uh, the North Slope producers holding the gas, uh, who have developed the gas, have an obligation either to ship on the pipeline or to sell the gas to the state. We've seen this rhetoric from the state before. That rhetoric is usually designed to try to force the producers into doing something that they don't want to do. The backup plan the state has is, okay, if you don't want to ship on the project, then you sell the gas to us and we'll ship on the project. That's a very bad idea because the state is not an expert marketer, doesn't have a broad range of marketing uh, 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 experience or, or outlets uh, would be lost if it tried to get in the competition of marketing LNG, sell it, buying and reselling LNG. Uh, the legislature's, legislature's former consultant said that would be a recipe for disaster if the state went down that road, and we agree. So if they're back to that rhetoric uh, of talking about you know, the producer's obligation either to, to ship or sell, 
uh, that would tend to lead you to believe that they didn't get the commitments they wanted, and they're now going to try to force the producers into doing something, or the state's going to step up and doing some do something it shouldn't do. So th- we we don't have a clear picture of what went on during the open season. The the picture that that is being painted out there is troubling, uh, and uh, and and we need to get clarity on what that is over the next over the next several weeks. And frankly, this may be a gate that that the project just didn't make. Uh, and we're going to need to step back and 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 think about going in a different direction uh, if we go in any direction at all. Uh, but but we're we're coming to another uh, another one of these put up or shut up points. The governor himself identified it last year, uh, and we need to figure out uh, what happened during this open season. War game this out for us for a second, Brad. Before we move on, uh, so if 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 he does get enough response, if there is a viable. Uh, offer on the table or enough interest in what's going on where where does it go from here and what kind of monies are we talking about and if there's not if it doesn't achieve that gate what happens then just give me a summation uh, in both directions sure so so if they got commitments if if we're getting commitments the next step is to go to the financial market um i mean we, we we're going to have to finance this thing it's not like we don't have $40 billion, 40 to $45 billion laying around in a bank account somewhere uh, that we that we can, you know, pull out, withdraw, and stick into this thing. Uh, the, the PF, the permanent fund is not is not that kind of bank account. So we're going to have to go out and finance this thing and and take the commitments we got out of the open season, take them to the financial markets, and start tying down financing. That's really how you figure out what your cost is going to. One of the big components of cost. And, and really a necessary component to figure out what the overall cost is. Um, so if they got commitments, then we need to hear discussions of we're going to the financial markets, we're seeing you know, what kind of financing we're going to be able to arrange. We're taking the next step down the road, which would be the, the financing. If they didn't get commitments, then, then we need to say this, this, pro- the, this approach to the project isn't working. We need to stop going down this approach to the project and we need to reassess uh, uh, where we're going from here. Frankly, uh, I think that may mean we go back to the producers and, and the state goes back to the producers and talks again uh, about where we were when we sort of took this, this road um, uh, of, of going down a state-led project. Producers at that time said, we need, to, we need to go into a pause here to sort of figure out where the markets are going and then collectively need to reassess going forward. Rather than, than, than do that, the state chose to bro- break out on its own and go down its own road. Uh, if they don't have the commitments, if we're not going to the next step, if we're still cycling in this, do we, are, is the market going to value this project or not? Then we need to stop that cycling and think about, you know, think about what the right way to go forward is, uh, if any. And, I fr- and frankly, I think that means go back to the producers and, and – and re-engage in those discussions that we left uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, one of the uh, one of the bright sides of this whole thing is, of course, uh, the discussion on what's going on with the markets. Of course, that has a uh, that whole has a, 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 a positive effect on the permanent fund uh, corpus and the permanent fund corporation. Uh, but it's not all. That doesn't mean it's all daisies. That means what must what goes up must come down. And Angela Rodell had a good piece uh, here that uh, we were discussing earlier uh, that looks at this a little deeper and says, yeah, this is this is good. She also talks a little bit about where the uh, you know, where the state is going to be using this money. What were you, what was your thoughts on this piece in the uh, Journal of Commerce? Well, anybody who anybody who who wants to understand the Permanent Fund Corporation and wants to understand sort of the issues that, that we need to be talking about on the Permanent Fund Corporation. Fund Corporation need to, needs to read this article. Great piece by uh, in the Anchorage Ju- uh, Journal of Commerce by uh, one of their lead reporters there, uh, and I found it highly highly interesting. Angela talks about you know how, how they invest, what the, the concerns they have on where the market's going. They talk a little bit about the fact that the market may be headed for a correction, and how the the permanent fund, the stock market may be headed for a correction, and how the permanent fund sort of you know, prepares for that. They talk about compensation. They talk about the organization. All very important things about the Permanent Fund Corporation. And if we're going to look at it one way or the other as one of our revenue sources uh, in the coming years for 
uh, Alaska. We need we need to be as aware of the permanent fund corporation as frankly we've been of the oil industry over the years, our, our other big revenue generators. So excellent excellent starting point for for those who haven't previously thought much about the permanent fund corporation. Excellent graduate course really for those who have thought a lot about the permanent fund corporation. The one issue in there that she raised that I think is worth discussing now um, is inflation proofing. Right. Um, what, one of the things you worry about in, a, in an investment portfolio is making sure that, that you always stay uh, apace with inflation. Um, we have a $60 billion fund. You want to make sure it at least uh, stays uh, on pace with inflation. Uh, you want it to grow more than inflation, but you don't want to lose to inflation. You don't want the value of it to go down with inflation. And and there's always been concern going all the way back to the beginning about how you inflation proof um, uh, the permanent fund. The the original statute, the statute that sets up the permanent fund dividend, uh, also talked about inflation proofing and provided uh, out of the other 50 percent, the permanent fund dividends calculated based upon 50 percent of the earnings. The statute provides that out of the other 50 percent, there's a contribution that's made back into the fund uh, annually. Uh, to to account for inflation and to keep the fund whole against inflation, um, and and that's been the historic way in which we've done it. Um, it's Angela gave a speech uh, or gave a presentation to the legislature a couple of years ago now, that that essentially said that approach isn't um, it, it is no longer necessary. There are other ways to do it, um, and frankly, I think those other ways probably are are better ways to do it. It's it's important though. I, I it's absolutely important that we continue to inflation proof the fund um, in some way. If we don't do that, uh, then the fund the fund potentially erodes uh, is eroded over time against inflation. And if we're going to rely on it as one of our one of the generators of revenue for the state, uh, then uh, then then we need to make sure it's inflation proof, or else or else we're gonna we're gonna lose. Uh, to inflation as we rely on that revenue source. Essentially so, essentially eating our seed corn, right? I mean, that's what she's talking yeah. about here. Yeah. And 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 but we need to do it in the right way. I think I think the the way that was set up in the original statute for a lot of reasons over inflation proof. It moved more money out of the earnings reserve into the permanent fund corpus uh, and and thus uh, off the books essentially from being able to help support government. Uh, or the dividend, either one, it moved more money than than was necessary. So, as part of this debate uh, about how we go forward with the permanent fund, uh, the earnings stream off the permanent fund, we need to talk about how we inflation proof in a way that truly inflation proofs, but doesn't over inflation proof, doesn't take, doesn't put more money back into the corpus uh, than is necessary to compensate for inflation. Um, and takes money away from the earnings stream. I mean, some people use that, frankly, as a way of, say, of justifying cutting the dividend. They say, you know, well, we've got inflation proof, so we need to take this money out of the earnings stream right. uh, to, to inflation proof. And so we can't pay as much out uh, in the dividend as we have historically. So inflation proofing is important not only to, you know, maintaining the revenue stream uh, that we have going into government from the permanent fund corporation. It's also uh, important to, to maintaining the dividend. So it's 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 a debate that it's a discussion that we need to have. An excellent starting point is this article in the Alaska Journal of Commerce, uh, but it's only a starting point. We need to keep talking about it. Well, we're out of time, uh, unfortunately. I still wanted to get into a couple other things, but uh, that's it for today. Brad Keithley, uh, thank you, my friend, for coming in and joining us. Thoughts on oil and gas is his blog. You can go read it out there. Brad, thanks for uh, for being part of it every week. Michael, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. The fastest three hours in radio.